Alright, this is going to be a video over chapter 9 dealing with momentum and collisions. First off, we're going to look at the definition for linear momentum. Linear momentum uses the symbol P, and in order to find momentum, which is P, I take mass times velocity. And velocity has a little arrow over it, and so does P, and that's because both momentum and velocity are vectors. And the SI unit that we're going to use for momentum, we're going to take mass, which would be in kilograms, and velocity, which would be meters per second. So the unit would be kilogram meter per second. Now that's the SI unit. You could probably also use like grams, miles per hour, but you would have a mass unit and then a velocity unit. And as I mentioned, momentum is a vector. Its direction is going to be the same as the velocity, and it has to have a velocity if you're going to have momentum. If you don't have a velocity, then you have no momentum. You can also find a change in momentum, and to find your change in momentum, we would use the symbol delta P to find the change in momentum. And your change in momentum is going to be your final momentum minus your initial. Now in this case, we can see that if an object bounces off, like in the case of B, we're going to have twice the momentum change. So any time that an object is going to hit and bounce back off, you're going to have the biggest change in momentum. And that is going to be in problem 9.66. It's discussing changes in momentum related to direct directions. Okay, we can also think about Newton's second law and momentum. Newton's second law says F equals MA, and this is valid if you have a constant mass. But if your mass changes, we are going to use this derivation of Newton's second law, which was change in momentum over change in time. And that comes from the fact that my acceleration, I can think about as being change in velocity over time. And this part is change in momentum over time. So that's a derivation that we can use if our mass is changing. Now impulse is how momentum is transferred. An impulse uses the letter I and it's also a vector. An impulse is our average force times our change in time. And the unit that we're going to use would be force, which would be newtons, times time, which is going to be in seconds, so newton seconds. Or that is also equivalent to kilogram meter per second, which is the same units as momentum. So they both have the same units. And as I mentioned, impulse is a vector, and it is how momentum is transferred. And it has the same direction as the force because it's a vector. So whatever the direction of this force is, that's the same as the direction of the impulse. Okay, so impulse is also the same as change in momentum because impulse is force times time, and that is the same thing as change in momentum. So impulse is equal to change in momentum. And that's what it says, impulse is equal to the change in momentum. And that one you're going to be using on the impulse and ranking problem in chapter 9. Uh, impulse is also calculated in exercise 9.12, and change in momentum, um, I don't see any of those yet. All right, an impulse, it, we said, is force times time. So let's say that our impulse in one scenario is the same as the impulse in my second scenario. This could be a big force in a small time, or this one could be a small force but a very large time. Both of those could be equivalent in, in impulse. So we're saying if you have a large force acting for a short time, that can be the same as a small force acting for a long time. And any time we're going to have a large time and a small force, that is going to be preferable when we're talking about impacts. For example, your head hitting something, we would like to increase the time, so we're going to use padding. Now, 
if we look in two dimensions, we said that they are both vectors. So impulse and momentum are both vectors. And we can use vector addition, meaning we can break each one of the components, whether it's impulse or momentum, using sine and cosine. So sine for my y and cosine for my x. And if you remember right, when we were going back and we were looking at vector addition, we would take, to find my y component, we would take whatever my magnitude was, like 15 sine of whatever my angle was, 30. And if we use cosine, that's going to find my x component. Then I would add all the x components up, and then I would add all the y components up. And when we did this before, we had a little table that had x's and y's, and then I would add all my x's and my y's, and then I would add those up so I had my x and my y component. Then once I had my x and y component, then I could use the Pythagorean theorem to find my total result, where r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. And this r, this resultant, this could be either your impulse or your momentum or your change in momentum, whatever vector it is you're talking about. And then we always used inverse tan to find our angle. So our angle was going to be inverse tan of y over x. And that's going to be used in 9.2. And then it's used again in 9.20. In 9.20, you have to find the change in your velocity. And they give you x components and they give you y components. So you're going to have to add up all your x's and add up all your y's. And then do the Pythagorean theorem. And that is going to tell you then what your change in momentum is. So you're going to find your change in momentum using the mass and the velocities that they give you in the x and the y's. And then once you find that, the change in momentum is the same thing as your impulse. And impulse. And then they also ask you to find your angle. So once you find your r value, which is going to be your change in momentum, then you can find the angle. So there's two of those that are going to have components in them. For conservation of linear momentum, we know that if our f net is 0, then momentum is conserved. Because we said that momentum was mass times change in velocity which is the same thing as force times time. Well, if force is zero, then that means the impulse is zero, which means the change in the momentum is zero. So that means that the final momentum would have to be equal to the initial momentum. And that's going to be important when we look at collisions. So we said the total momentum is always conserved, but the individual momenta of the components may change. So just because you have a whole system, maybe three things in it, the total will be conserved, but not necessarily each component. So let's say we have a star and it explodes. That means that all these individual components still are going to have momenta. So they all have momentum. But then when we add all those together, this piece would cancel with these ones because they're in opposite directions. So in that case, the total momentum would stay the same. All right. And in this case, they show us that we have one force this way and we have one force this way. So in that case, their total momentum would be conserved. Now, we have different kinds of collisions. We have inelastic collisions. And those are where momentum is conserved, but kinetic energy is not. And if it's completely inelastic, they stick together. And there are going to be some inelastic collision problems. There is 1D collisions, and there are inelastic ones. There is a problem like that that you're going to be doing on your assignment. Okay, so if I have a completely inelastic collision, then I have, here I have one train, and this one's sitting still. This is like what we did in our lab, and then they stick together, and they go together. So I have the momentum of the first train plus the momentum of the second train. That's going to be my total initial momentum. And then at the end, they stick together. So that would be the two of them stick together times their final velocity together. And if the initial equals the final, then this equation would be equal to that. 
So this is going to be what we're going to do when we were talking about inelastic collisions and that problem that you have to do where it's collisions in one dimension, dimension that are um, inelastic. If we have two dimensions, then of course we're going to look at our x and y, and we related to that already when we talked about impulse and momentum and how you have to break them down into their components. Another example of an inelastic collision, and you don't have a particular problem like this one. There's not one where you have a ballistics pendulum. But in this case, this would have some kind of initial mass and velocity. It would hit this one, which would be at zero. They would stick together, so the bullet inside the block, and they would both be rising a certain height. And it would be a conservation of energy problem. The second type of collisions are elastic. An elastic kinetic energy is conserved, and momentum is still conserved. So all collisions, momentum is conserved. It doesn't matter what kind it is, inelastic or elastic, they're all conserved. However, inelastic kinetic energy was not conserved, but in an elastic, where they bounce off, it is conserved. So that's the biggest difference between the two kinds of collisions. And in this case, we can see a one dimension where we have these two hit, and then they would go bouncing off in different speeds. So they don't hook together at the end. And you're going to have some elastic collisions. You have collisions in 1D. You have an elastic one. And then 9.22, 9.36, and 9.60. All of those are dealing with collisions. And for our elastic, since they don't go together, I would have my momentum of my first one. So M1V1 plus M2V2. And at the end, it would still be M1V1 plus M2V2 if you had two objects. Now sometimes they're going to give you an object where you let's say that you have one skater and another skater and they're going to push off each other so at first they're standing still which means their initial momentum is zero and then they push off and they go off in opposite directions so in that case the final momentum has to be conserved it's still zero so what that tells you is that the momentum of this person m1 v1 has to be equal to m2 v2 and keep in mind, when you're dealing with collisions, if you have velocities and one's going one way and one's going another direction, those velocities have to be, one has to be positive and one has to be negative. And usually we think like this direction would be positive and this direction, you know, left would be negative. And make sure you put those in there. Like if this velocity is positive and this one's negative, you're going to have to put those in there, otherwise your calculations won't work out right. The other direction, the other way you can think about this one is if you didn't want to set them equal, you'd have the two added together and I know they have to be equal to zero because we said beginning they didn't have any momentum because they weren't moving. So it means at the end they still wouldn't have any momentum. This one's positive and this one's negative. That's how they would add together to be zero. So you could either think about making one of them positive and one of them negative and setting it up this way, or you could say the two are equal to each other. And that would be the same, like, let's say you're standing in a boat and you jump off the boat and then the boat goes the other direction. That's the kind you would use. Or if you're talking about a gun where you shoot a bullet, and so if this is my gun, the bullet's going to go this way, and then the gun is going to kick back and hit you the other way. That's called a recoil velocity. And those two are going to have to be equal to each other because to start with when you're holding the gun with the bullet in it nothing is moving so the initial momentum is zero which means the final has to be zero because it's conserved so then I know that the momentum of the bullet has to be equal to the momentum of the gun in the other direction to make them add up to zero so if they talk about recoil velocities recoil means it goes back in the other direction like the kickback of a gun and so you're going to have some that are like that All right, so there's two equations that you're going to be using in some of those elastic collision problems. We're going to have the momentum one that we looked at before, and then 
There's also going to be dealing with conservation of kinetic energy in the elastic ones. And don't forget, kinetic energy is one half mv squared. Because some of those are asking you to find if kinetic energy is conserved. So you would have to find the initial kinetic energy and the final kinetic energy. And then you would have to see if the kinetic energy changed. Because if the initial was equal to the final, then that means it's conserved. So if Ke1 equals Kef, initial and final, if those are equal to each other, then we say it's conserved. But if you have some kind of change in kinetic energy, that would be the difference between the final and the initial. So the last section is on center of mass. And the center of mass is the point where you can balance your system. So if you think about a having a heavier mass on this side and a lighter mass on this side, it would be balanced closer to the side where there's more mass. If you have equal masses on each side, then your center of mass would be in the very middle. So if you have two objects, the center of the mass is closer to the more massive object. And the center of mass doesn't necessarily have to be within the object. For example, in our ring, the center of mass is not located anywhere on the ring. It is actually in the center of the ring, where the ring actually isn't. And if you want to find the velocity of the center of mass, then you would use your momentums, and then you would be dividing by your masses. So total momentum at the top over the total mass on the bottom. And if we wanted to find the acceleration of the center of mass, then in that case we would use the forces, which would be ma, so the total of all of the forces divided by the total of the masses, and that would tell you your acceleration. If you just want to find the center of mass and figure out where an object is going to be balanced, and there is going to be a problem like that, which is 9.46. 9.46 asks you to find the center of mass. of, I think it's a cart, and in your shopping cart you have, I think, two boxes of cereal, and they want to know where you're going to put the gallon of milk so that the center of mass is in the very center. So they want to know where I should put this gallon of milk so that the center of mass is going to lie within the center of the shopping cart. And in this particular problem, you would want to use mass times however far it is from the middle. So you could think about like whatever this distance is. And then your two boxes of cereal, however far apart they are. So if you do m times distance, that's how you're going to be thinking about it. And then we want the center to be in the middle. So that would be m1 plus m2 plus m3 since we have three objects and we want it to be in the very center and I think they told us this distance is 0.75 so it'd be half of the 0.75 that has to be equal to the mass of 1 and the mass of 2 because those are the two cereal boxes and I think they say that those are from the n so whatever their distance is, plus the mass of your milk carton, and then whatever that distance is. And this you would have to find. In this one, I can't remember what they tell you the distance is, but you plug in the distance that those two are from the end. So I think they're placed clear on the end, so in that case it would be that 0.75 total. And then you would want to figure out where this one is placed from the end, and that would be the distance that you would find. So I think this is 0.75. All right, and then the rest of this is kind of a summary of Chapter 9. And that would conclude the lecture video for Chapter 9.